welcome to IoT for Everyone Part 2. Uh, my name is Andrew Baumus, and in this video we're going to take the Stick C and actually program it with the MicroPython environment called UIFlow, and that will lead into Part 3 where we'll program it. Okay, so let's just get started by looking at uh, the IFFTT platform and making an account and getting the webhook set up. We begin by going to the IFTTT website by going to IFTTT.com in your favorite browser. If you have an account, uh, you can go ahead and sign in. If you don't, uh, you can go ahead and create an account now. I have already have an account, so I'm going to st skip that process and just sign uh, right in, but, it, but feel free to pause and, and make your account before continuing. I'm going to go ahead and just log in with my Google account because it's a little bit easier. So I'll continue with Google. And now I'm logged into IFTTT. If you've never used IFTTT before, it's basically a cloud platform that lets you connect uh, various services together in a way that they don't uh, naturally already integrate. And so they do that through something called activities. And what we're trying to do is create an activity that will connect uh, webhooks to emails because that was sort of our proposed solution. So to do that, we're going to go to our uh, user accounts icon, go to create. Uh, we need to move to the IFTTT platform by clicking this link. And when you log in, if you haven't ever been to the IFTTT platform before, it'll ask you to create a, a, a company. That company really is just representing you or whatever you're developing this IoT plot, a device for. So feel free to name it however you want. I've just named mine my username, a Valmos. And so after you create your company, you'll have a screen like this, at which point you can go to applets and you can create a new applet. When, you, when the page finally loads, we're going to define a trigger and an action. And so uh, if we go back to our slides for one second, you can see that the IoT device is supposed to use a webhook into the IFTT platform. That's the trigger when that webhook happens. And that action or the result of the trigger is an email going down to wherever the predefined email is. So if we go back to IFFT's page, we can see that they want us to tell them what the trigger is. We can type in webhook and select webhooks. Underneath webhooks, there's really only one type of trigger. That is when, you, when the cloud receives a web request to do something. So we'll go ahead and select that one. The event name is sort of a user-friendly name for what this webhook will mean. So in this case, we're going to call it order supplies. And the default value is the default uh, name or sort of the, the programmer's name, if you will, for this webhook. And so it shouldn't have things like spaces or anything like that. And it should be somewhat short, but maybe uh, descriptive. In this case, probably just order supplies is good again, but we'll use an underscore instead of a space. Um, when a person enables your activity in their IFTT account, uh, they'll be able to name it whatever they want. This, what you're typing here is just your suggested default. Okay, so now we have the webhook hooked up. We need to tell IFFT what the action will be. You can have actually many actions if you want. In this case, we only want to send one email, so we'll only add one. So we do that by clicking action. This, we search their services they have available. We'd like to send an email, so we pick email. And the only really thing email can do is send an email, so we'll choose that. Okay, then the first uh, field of this service is the subject, and this is the subject uh, of the email that will get sent. So I'm going to go ahead and delete the default here and make the subject. It's time to order oops, supplies. Okay. And then in the body uh, field is whatever is going to be in the body of the email. And so I'm going to delete the default again and say on. Oops. And if you look down here, there's this add ingredients option. And so built into the service is some what they call ingredients or data that's defined uh, at the time that the activity runs. And so one of them is the occurred at. So you can say on occurred at someone indicated that supplies need to be ordered. And now when the email comes, it'll say something like on February 3rd, 
2019 and 4.59 p.m., someone indicated that supplies need to be ordered. So just in case the emails get confused or lost, you can go back and, uh, and order them and know if, if you've handled it or not. We could create more actions if we want, but we don't, uh, we don't need anything other than the email for this case. Now we need to give the Apple a title. This is basically just for the IFTTT's uh, web UI so that you can figure out what applets you have on and off. So we'll just call it email when uh, supplies are low. And the description is also required, so we'll just write uh, applet that sends email. And you can really put whatever you want here. Okay, then we'll click save. And because we've created it within our, our, our private development organization, this applet's only accessible to me and not to the world. But uh, if you purchased uh, the paid access to IFFTT, you could actually share this with other people and they could, they could enable it themselves. And so we'll go down here and you can see the, what the applet card looks like and we can choose view it on IFTTT. So that'll send us back to just the normal IFTTT website. And I have our applet email when supplies are low and we can connect it. And what that's doing is telling um, uh, IFF, our IFTTT that I would like that applet to run under my user account. And because we've never created an email applet before, IFFT is asking us where would you like the emails to be sent. For the purposes of this video, I've created a Gmail account, my name at, or, uh, followed by iot at gmail.com, but here you would type in your email address so that you would get the email. Um, they have a security feature, so uh, we'll have to go fetch the email that they just sent and type this pin so that they know we own it. And now we're uh, enabling the applet. And here we can make the webhook name whatever we want, but we'll go ahead and just use the uh, default that we uh, supplied. And now we're connected. Okay, so we can actually test this already. So if we go to home, and you'll see now we ha it'll show the different applets that we have or, and services that we have connected. We can go into webhooks and within the webhook, it'll show you that the, the, that, that's, the service is connected to our, our, our email when supplies low applet. And if we go up to documentation, it'll teach us how we're supposed to use this uh, webhook. And so this is the URL that you're supposed to use. And you fill in right here where it says event with the name of the event that you uh, created. So we, we called it order supplies. And now basically, as long as you make a web request to this URL, uh, or as soon as you make a web request to this URL, uh, a email will get sent to you to the email that you have on file. So if we go ahead, copy the email. And remember we said that the IoT device doing a webhook is the same thing as a browser going to the same location. So if we open up a new tab, paste that uh, URL into it and click enter, you'll get a message saying congratulations. And if we go back to our email, and wait a second, you can see we've gotten an email from the IF, our IFTTT platform. It's time to order supplies and it has the event time in it. And so now we've uh, uh, built up the cloud side. We don't even really need to think about it much anymore. We can turn our attentions to building the device and all it really needs to do is make sure it's, go it's hitting this web address uh, whenever the button gets pushed. So the device we've selected for this uh, uh, video is the M5 Stack six, or Stick C. There are lots and lots of devices out there on the market that you can use uh, to build something like this. This particular product has some um, features that make it very easy for you to get started as a beginner, and that's why we've selected it. Uh, it's uh, this orange device here. There, it, within the M5 stack, there are actually several different um, products uh, that get kind of bigger and more advanced as you go. This is a, a small one that actually gets sold with a strap that you can put it on your wrist to sort of do Fitbit style and some mounts that you can mount them on the wall. Uh, they come with sensors that are, that are uh, sort of pre-developed to work with. Uh, one of them, for example, is this environmental sensor here that measures pressure and temperature and things like that. And they call these hats and they actually sit on the top of the device right here. 
And then there are other sensors like this soil moisture sensor uh, that's connected through the groove port and that's a cable that goes out the back of the sensor into this port right here. There are tons and tons of sensors available for you to buy that are all kind of uh, pre-designed and work together and there, uh, there's libraries for you to use so you don't have to write much code. And the, the sensors themselves cost anywhere from like the dollar to tens of dollars range depending on um, how what they are. And the actual uh, processing device itself is about $12. So inside of this orange box is a processor called the ESP32. Uh, it's a, a relatively new processor that's pretty powerful for its in, sort of embedded nature. And built into it is both uh, Wi-Fi radio as well as a Bluetooth and uh, Bluetooth low energy radio. So one of the, that's why it's uh, kind of become very popular in the hobbyist world because you can really quickly get connectivity. Uh, built into this orange box, the Stick C, is a 5 volt uh, rechargeable battery that gives you a couple hours of battery life, as well as uh, a six axis IMU, which is acceleration and gyroscope data, and a real time clock that allows you to track time. Built into the case are, are two user buttons, an LCD screen that you can write graphics and text to, a red LED that can indicate status, microphone uh, inputs, IR transmitters, uh, and a various of other sensors uh, attachable through the hat and the groove port like we've already talked about. So you might be wondering, okay, it's a great platform, it's cheap, but how do we program it? Well, there's a lot of ways to program it, all the way from plain traditional C to a very high level thing called UI flow. So quickly, we'll just go through a few of them, but we'll focus only on, on the highest level one. Uh, first, we have just plain C. This is like the C programming language. It's definitely the lowest op level option. It's going to require you to have the most knowledge of programming, but it does give you complete and full control over the core. And there's also some operating system like abstractions available for uh, in, as open source projects like FreeRTOS and others that really make it powerful. The next up in sort of simplicity, if you will, or ease of use is Arduino. And this is C and C++ as well, but it's a very large open source library that abstracts away a lot of the low level details. So it makes it easy for you to use the peripherals and all of the functionality, um, but takes away some of the control. Next up the chain is MicroPython. This is a forward thinking open source project that impl actually implemented a very light version of the Python 3 language on microcontrollers directly. So it allows you to use the Python language, which is um, notable by um, uh, beginners and advanced programmers alike and its ease of use and um, uh, sort of the ability to just jump in and use it without having to be an expert beforehand. It increases uh, the developer's efficiency and just makes a lot of things easy. It's a little weird for a high, very high level language like that to be running on a really low level platform like your microcontroller, but MicroPython has, seems to have bridged that uh, gap pretty well. And so then lastly is UI flow, and that's really what we're going to be using. UI flow is nothing more than sort of a graphical layer on top of MicroPython. So underneath you'll actually be using MicroPython, but you won't have to write any of the code. You'll be able to create uh, flow graphs like this, where you can sort of think of the program more logically. And then this tool will convert your flow graph into the equivalent Python code and program it for you. One of the other advantages uh, UIFlow has is its ability to be uh, programmed over Wi-Fi. So you don't actually need this device connected to your computer to be able to program with it. That, that uh, simplifies development. It also makes it easy for you to push updates to your devices uh, once they're already installed and deployed. Uh, if the battery life isn't good enough for you, you may still need a battery or a cable, USB-C cable plug into it, but merely just for power. So you can use sort of like a traditional phone adapter or something like that uh, to, to power this device. They also make uh, bigger batteries that you can attach to the package to give it a better battery life. Okay, so to get started, oh, uh, I should mention also that UIFlow has a ton of documentation to help uh, bridge the gap from this video to more complicated things, and this, here's the link uh, that's usually up, it's updated quite often. So to get started using UIFlow, we have to actually flash UIFlow to the USB, or to the uh, Stick C device. This uh, is the only time that you'll have to connect the device to the computer, and it's sort of the the most technical part of the whole project, although it's very uh, much just point and click if you know what you're doing. So let me just go through and show you how. Uh, and then uh, once you do it once, you won't ever have to do it again. So we start by 
going to the start menu and going to the device manager. And the reason we need to go to the device manager is because we need to know what uh, COM port the, the uh, stick C will be. So if we open up the device manager and we go to the ports option here, we can see right now that there's only a COM3. If I go ahead and plug the device into the computer, when I plug it in, it'll update and we have a new device, COM4. And so now we know that our stick C is known to Windows as COM4. Okay, to go ahead and get it programmed, we'll start by uh, going to um, the UI Flows website. So we'll go to flow.m5stack.com. This will be where you do almost all of your work once we do the first flashing. This is where all of the programming happens. But to get started, we, we're, gonna, we're gonna skip all these fields and go right down to, to M5 Burner. And if you have Windows or Mac, you can choose which one you want. Here we're running Windows, so we'll, we'll download the Windows. And I've actually already downloaded because it's our 63 megs, so instead of making you watch the download uh, indicator with me, I'm gonna go ahead and click Cancel and just go uh, to where I downloaded it on the desktop. And, uh, I, when I, and when I first downloaded, I only had the zip. So if you right click, you can do extract all and you can tell it to extract it wherever you would like. Here I've extracted it right next to it. So I can go into the folder and then I can actually run the tool M5 burner. Uh, if you haven't ever run it before, you might get a notification by Windows asking if, you would really, if you'd like to run it or not. You can go ahead and, and tell it that it's acceptable. Now M5 Burner is actually a tool that M5 Stack creates to flash all of the devices that they create. And so on the left side here, you have lots of different uh, programs. You've got different versions, UI Flow, M5 Camera, M5 Faces, and so on. We're gonna stick with the UI Flow, and we're gonna go ahead and install the version 1.4.1 beta. Uh, it's been around for a while, and I've used it quite a bit, and it's not really that unstable, but it has some additional features that are nice, so we'll go ahead and use the beta version. If you're watching this video later and they've released new versions, just I would just go ahead and install whatever the newest version is. But to get this very specific version of, of a UI flow, we select it and then we can choose this little download icon here. And then in the background, uh, it will download the firmware. And once it downloads, uh, it'll now be white instead of gray. So we can select it. We can come up to the COM port we, from before, we, we knew that the device is COM4, so we'll select COM4. We'll leave the baud rate to its default, and we have a stick C, so we'll select stick, stick C under series. Once we've done that, we can click erase, and that will erase whatever is on the device currently. If this is new out of the package, it's a little testing program, but if you've used it for other things, it may be whatever you last programmed onto it. Once you see um, the finished line come up, you can go ahead and click burn. And what burn does is it takes the firmware that we just downloaded over here and actually flashes it onto the memory of the stick C plugged into your computer. And that itself is the MicroPython environment and the UI flow layer that'll allow us to do some easy programming. Once you see a message leaving, staying in bootloader, you know that the programming is done. At that point, you can uh, unplug it from your computer. And then on the bottom left-hand side of the device, there's a button, a side button. If you push and hold it for several seconds, the device will turn off. And then if you push it again, it will turn on and you should see a UI Flow logo. And now to uh, connect the device to the UI Flow uh, programming environment, the website, we need to connect uh, the device to a local Wi-Fi point to give it internet. And to do that, we'll have to take our computer and connect it to the Wi-Fi network that the little device is broadcasting. Once we connect, we'll teach it the username and password of the correct Wi-Fi, uh, the device will restart, and instead of broadcasting its own network, it'll start connecting to the one in your room, and at that point, everything can be programmed.